Hi, thanks for tuning in to the Children of Our Lady podcast brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. My name is Thomas, and I'd like to welcome everyone to a new episode of the show. Well, I thank you all for coming here to part two of this little two-part series that we have here on the Children of Our Lady podcast, where today we'll be listening to the second section of Chapter 5 from the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus the Gory. And like I mentioned last week, in this chapter, St. Alphonsus takes the same subject and breaks it down into two different sections. And so today we'll be listening to the second and final section of this chapter. But before we get into the reading today, I did want to say that I hope everyone had a great and blessed Thanksgiving day. I really do enjoy Thanksgiving. It's definitely one of my favorite days of the year. And I hope it was a great day for all of you. And on another note, it's remarkable to me that tomorrow is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. Definitely something to be very thankful to God that he's given us this time, allowed us to see another liturgical year go by. And I hope for all of us as this liturgical year comes to a close and we prepare for the beginning of a new one, that we have a great close to this liturgical year and spend this week very well. It's nice that we also have a feast day of Our Lady, the Feast of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal this week. The Miraculous Medal is certainly a great gift, something to be thankful for, and one thing we should remember while wearing the Miraculous Medal as, yes, it is an exterior sign of our devotion to Our Lady, We should also let it serve as a reminder of our duties toward Our Lady to lead a good life, to always strive to be pleasing to God like Our Lady was. And I guess as it is an exterior expression of our faith, it should also be a reminder of the interior life that we should have, our devotion to Our Lady and the practice of a good Catholic life. Well, I think now is a good time for us to get into our reading for today of Section 2 of Chapter 5. Then after that, unlike last week's episode, I'll come back for my commentary on the chapter as a whole, I guess it is. Then we'll conclude with our quote and our prayer to Our Lady. Chapter 5, Section 2. The same subject continued. St. Bernard says that as a man and a woman cooperated in our ruin, so it was proper that another man and another woman should cooperate in our redemption. And these two were Jesus and his mother Mary. There is no doubt, says the saint, that Jesus Christ alone was more than sufficient to redeem us, but it was more becoming that both sexes should cooperate in the reparation of an evil in causing which both had shared. Hence, blessed Albert the Great calls Mary the helper of redemption. And this blessed virgin herself revealed to St. Bridget that as Adam and Eve sold the world for an apple, so did she with her son redeem it as it were with one heart. This is confirmed by St. Anselm, who says that although God could create the world out of nothing, Yet, when it was lost by sin, he would not repair the evil without the cooperation of Mary. Suarez says that Mary cooperated in our salvation in three ways. First, by having merited by a merit of congruity the incarnation of the Word. Secondly, by having continually prayed for us whilst she was living in this world. Thirdly, by having willingly sacrificed the life of her Son to God. For this reason, our Lord has justly decreed that as Mary cooperated in the salvation of man with so much love, and at the same time gave such glory to God, so all men through her intercession are to obtain their salvation. Mary is called the cooperator in our justification, for to her God has entrusted all graces intended for us. And therefore St. Bernard affirms that all men, past, present, and to come, should look upon Mary as the means and negotiator of the salvation of all ages. Jesus Christ says that no one can find him unless the Eternal Father first draws him by the means of divine grace. No one comes to me unless my father draws him. Thus also does Jesus address his mother, says Richard of St. Lawrence. No one comes to me unless my mother first of all draws him by her prayers. Jesus was the fruit of Mary, as St. Elizabeth told her, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Whoever, therefore, desires the fruit must go to the tree. Whoever desires Jesus must go to Mary, and whoever finds Mary will most certainly find Jesus. When St. Elizabeth saw that the most blessed virgin had come to visit her in her own house, not knowing how to thank her, and filled with humility, she exclaimed, And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should visit me? But how could this be, we may ask? Did not St. Elizabeth already know that not only Mary, but also Jesus, had entered her house? Why then does she say that she is unworthy to receive the mother, and not rather that she is unworthy to receive the son who had come to visit her? Ah, yes, it was that the saint knew full well that when Mary comes, she brings Jesus, and therefore it was sufficient to thank the mother without naming the son. She is like the merchant's ship, she bringeth her bread from afar. Mary was this fortunate ship that brought us Jesus Christ from heaven, who is the living bread that comes down from heaven to give us eternal life. As he himself says, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. 
And hence, Richard of St. Lawrence says that in the sea of this world, all will be lost who are not received into this ship, that is to say, all who are not protected by Mary. And therefore, he adds, as often as we see ourselves in danger of perishing in the midst of the temptations and contending passions of this life, let us have recourse to Mary and cry out quickly, O lady, help us, save us, if thou wilt not see us perish. And remark by the by that this writer does not scruple to address these words to Mary. Save us, we perish. As does a certain author already noticed who says that we cannot ask Mary to save us, as this belongs to God alone. But since a culprit condemned to death can beg a royal favorite to save him by interceding with the king that his life may be spared, why cannot we ask the mother of God to save us by obtaining us eternal life? St. John Damascene scrupled not to address her in these words. Pure and immaculate virgin, save me, and deliver me from eternal damnation. St. Bonaventure called Mary the salvation of those who invoked her. The Holy Church approves of the invocation by also calling her the salvation of the weak. And shall we scruple to ask her to save us when the way of salvation is open to none otherwise than through Mary, as a certain author remarks? And before him, St. Germanus had said the same thing, speaking of Mary. No one is saved but through thee. But let us now see what else the saints say of the need in which we are of the intercession of the Divine Mother. The glorious St. Cajetan used to say that we may seek for graces, but shall never find them without the intercession of Mary. This is confirmed by St. Antoninus, who thus beautifully expresses himself. Whoever asks and expects to obtain graces without the intercession of Mary, endeavors to fly without wings. For, as Pharaoh said to Joseph, the land of Egypt is in thy hands, and addressed all who came to him for food to Joseph, go to Joseph. So does God send us to Mary when we seek for grace. Go to Mary. For he has decreed, says St. Bernard, that he will grant no graces otherwise than by the hands of Mary. And thus, says Richard of St. Lawrence, our salvation is in the hands of Mary. So that we Christians may with much greater reason say of her than the Egyptians of Joseph, our salvation is in thy hands. The venerable Raymond Giordano repeats the same thing. Our salvation is in her hands. Cassian speaks in still stronger terms. He says absolutely that the salvation of all depends on their being favored and protected by Mary. He who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. St. Bernardine of Siena thus addresses this blessed virgin. O lady, since thou art the dispenser of all graces, and since the grace of salvation can only come through thy hands, our salvation depends on thee. Therefore, Richard of St. Lawrence had good reason for saying that, as we should fall into the abyss if the ground were withdrawn from under our feet, so does a soul deprived of the succor of Mary first fall into sin and then into hell. St. Bonaventure says that God will not save us without the intercession of Mary, and that, as a child cannot live without a nurse to suckle it, so no one can be saved without the protection of Mary. Therefore, he exhorts us to thirst after devotion to her, to preserve it with care, and never to abandon it until we have received her maternal blessing in heaven. And whoever, exclaimed St. Germanus, could know God were it not for thee, O most holy Mary, who could be saved? Who would be preserved from dangers? Who would receive any grace were it not for thee, O mother of God, O full of grace? The following are the beautiful words in which he expresses himself. There is no one, O most holy Mary, who can know God but through thee. No one who can be saved or redeemed but through thee, O mother of God. No one who can be delivered from dangers but through thee, O virgin mother. No one who obtains mercy but through thee, O filled with all grace. And in another place, addressing her, he says, No one would be free from the effects of the concupiscence of the flesh and from sin unless thou didst open the way to him. And as we have access to the Eternal Father, says St. Bernard, only through Jesus Christ, so have we access to Jesus Christ only through Mary. By thee we have access to the Son, O blessed finder of grace, bearer of life, and mother of salvation, that we may receive him by thee, who through thee was given to us. This is the reason given by the saint why our Lord has determined that all shall be saved by the intercession of Mary, and therefore he calls her the mother of grace and of our salvation. Then, asks St. Germanus, what will become of us? What hope can we have of salvation, if thou dost abandon us, O Mary, who art the life of Christians? But, says the modern author already quoted, if all graces come through Mary, when we implore the intercession of other saints, they must have recourse to the mediation of Mary. But that, he says, no one believes or ever dreamt. As to believing it, I reply, that in that there can be no error or difficulty. What difficulty can there be in saying that God, in order to honor his mother, and having made her queen of saints, and willing that all graces should be dispensed by her hands, should also will that the saints should address themselves to her to obtain favors for their clients? 
And as to saying that no one ever dreamt of such a thing, I find that St. Bernard, St. Anselm, St. Bonaventure, Suarez, and others expressly declare it to be the case. In vain, says St. Bernard, would a person ask other saints for a favor if Mary did not interpose to obtain it. Some other author, explaining the words of the psalm, All the rich among the people shall entreat thy countenance, says that the saints are the rich of that great people of God, who, when they wish to obtain a favor from God for their clients, recommend themselves to Mary, and she immediately obtains it. And Father Suarez correctly remarks that we beg the saints to be our intercessors with Mary, because she is their queen and sovereign lady. Amongst the saints, he says, we do not make use of one to intercede with the other, as all are of the same order, but we do ask them to intercede with Mary because she is their sovereign and queen. And this is precisely what St. Benedict promised to St. Francis of Rome, as we read in Father Marches, for he appeared to her, and taking her under his protection, he promised that he would be her advocate with the Divine Mother. In confirmation of this, St. Anselm addresses our Blessed Lady and says, O Lady, whatever all the saints united with thee can obtain, thou canst obtain alone. And why is this? asks the saint. Why is it that thou alone hast such great power? Ah, it is because thou alone art the mother of our common Redeemer. Thou art the spouse of God. Thou art the universal Queen of heaven and earth. If thou dost not speak for us, no saint will pray for or help us. But if thou beginnest to pray for us, then will all the saints do the same and succor us. So that Father Signeri, in his devout client of Mary, applying with the Catholic Church the words of Ecclesiasticus to her, I alone have compassed the circuit of heaven, says that, as the first sphere by its motion sets all the others in motion, so is it when Mary prays for a soul, immediately the whole heavenly court begins to pray with her. Nay more, says St. Bonaventure, whenever the most sacred virgin goes to God to intercede for us, she, as queen, commands all the angels and saints to accompany her and unite their prayers with hers. And thus, finally, do we understand why the Holy Church requires that we should salute and invoke the Divine Mother under the glorious title of Our Hope. The impious Luther said that he could not endure that the Roman Church should call Mary, who is only a creature, our hope. For, said he, God alone and Jesus Christ as our mediator is our hope. And God curses those who place their hope in a creature, according to the prophet Jeremiah. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. But the church teaches us to invoke Mary on all occasions and to call her our hope. Hail our hope. Whoever places his confidence in a creature independently of God, he certainly is cursed by God. For God is the only source and dispenser of every good. And the creature without God is nothing and can give nothing. But if our Lord has so disposed it, as we have already proved that he has done, that all graces should pass by Mary as by a channel of mercy, we not only can but ought to assert that she, by whose means we receive the divine graces, is truly our hope. And therefore St. Bernard says that she is his greatest confidence and the whole foundation of his hope. St. John Damascene says the same thing, for he thus addresses the Most Blessed Virgin. O Lady, in thee have I placed all my hope, and with my eyes fixed on thee, from thee do I expect salvation. St. Thomas says that Mary is the whole hope of our salvation. And St. Ephraim addressing her says, O most holy virgin, receive us under thy protection, if thou wilt see us saved, for we have no hope of salvation but through thy means. Let us then, in the words of St. Bernard, endeavor to venerate this divine mother with the whole affection of our hearts, for such is the will of God, who is pleased that we should receive every good thing from her hand. And therefore the saint exhorts us, whenever we desire or ask for any grace, to recommend ourselves to Mary, and to be assured that we shall receive it by her means. For he says, if thou dost not deserve the favor from God, Mary, who will ask it for thee, will deserve to receive it. Because thou wast unworthy of the gift, it was bestowed on Mary, that through her thou mightest receive all that thou hast. The saint then advises us to recommend all that we offer to God to the care of Mary, be they good works or prayers, if we wish our Lord to accept them. Whatever thou mayest offer to God, be sure to recommend it to Mary, in order not to meet with a repulse. Example The history of Theophilus, written by Eutychian, Patriarch of Constantinople, and who was an eyewitness of the fact he relates, is well known. It is attested by St. Peter Damian, St. Bernard, St. Bonaventure, St. Antoninus, and by others quoted by Father Crasset. Theophilus was archdeacon of the church of Adena, a city of Cilicia and he was held in such veneration by the people that they wished to have him for their bishop, but he, out of humility, refused the dignity. It happened that evil-disposed persons accused him falsely of some crime, and for which he was deposed from his archdiaconry. 
He took this so much to heart that, blinded by passion, he went to consult a Jewish magician, who made him consult Satan, that he might help him in his misfortune. The devil told him that if he desired to be helped by him, he must renounce Jesus and his mother Mary, and consign him the act of renunciation written in his own hand. Theophilus immediately complied with the demand. The next day, the bishop, having discovered that he had been deceived, asked the archdeacon's pardon and restored him to office. No sooner was this accomplished that his conscience was torn with remorse, and he could do nothing but weep. What could he do? He went to a church, and there, casting himself all in tears at the feet of an image of Mary, he thus addressed her, O Mother of God, I will not despair as long as I can have access to thee, who art so compassionate, and hast the power to help me. He remained thus weeping and praying to our Blessed Lady for forty days, when, lo, one night the Mother of Mercy appeared to him, and said, O Theophilus, what hast thou done? Thou hast renounced my friendship and that of my son, and for whom? For his and my enemy. O lady, answered Theophilus, thou must pardon me, and obtain my forgiveness from thy son. Mary, seeing his confidence, replied, Be of good heart, I will intercede for thee with God. Theophilus, encouraged by these consoling words, redoubled his tears, mortifications, and prayers, and never left the image. At length Mary again appeared to him, and with a cheerful countenance said, Theophilus, be of good heart, I have presented thy tears and prayers to God. He has accepted them, and has already pardoned thee. But from this day forward, be grateful to him and faithful. But, O lady, replied Theophilus, that is not yet enough to satisfy me entirely. The enemy still possesses that impious writing in which I renounced thee and thy son. Thou canst oblige him to surrender it. Three days afterwards, Theophilus awoke in the night and found the writing on his breast. On the following day, he went to the church where the bishop was, and, in the presence of an immense concourse of people, cast himself at his feet, and with bitter tears related all that had taken place, and delivered into his hands the infamous writing. The bishop committed it to the flames in the presence of the whole people, who did nothing but weep for joy, and praised the goodness of God, and the mercy of Mary shown towards this poor sinner. But he, returning to the church of our Blessed Lady, remained there for three days, and then expired, his heart filled with joy and returning thanks to Jesus and to his most holy mother. Prayer O Queen and Mother of Mercy, who dispensest graces to all who have recourse to thee with so much liberality because thou art a queen, and with so much love because thou art our most loving mother, to thee do I, who am so devoid of merit and virtue, and so loaded with debts to the divine justice, recommend myself this day. O Mary, thou holdest the keys of all the divine mercies, Forget not my miseries, and leave me not in my poverty. Thou art so liberal with all, and give us more than thou art asked for. O be thus liberal with me. O lady, protect me. This is all that I ask of thee. If thou protectest me, I fear nothing. I fear not the evil spirits, for thou art more powerful than all of them. I fear not my sins, for thou by one word canst obtain their full pardon from God. And if I have thy favor, I do not even fear an angry God, for a single prayer of thine will appease him. In fine, if thou protectest me, I hope all, for thou art all-powerful. O Mother of Mercy, I know that thou takest pleasure and dost glory in helping the most miserable, and, provided they are not obstinate, that thou canst help them. I am a sinner, but I am not obstinate. I desire to change my life. Thou canst, then, help me. O help me and save me. I now place myself entirely in thy hands. Tell me what I must do in order to please God, and I am ready for all and hope to do all with thy help, O Mary. Mary, my mother, my light, my consolation, my refuge, my hope. Amen, amen, amen. All right, and that's where we'll stop with our readings for today. Well, I'm back after a couple of weeks, since this week's reading was basically a continuation of last week's. It makes sense why St. Alphonse spent more time on this topic than others, since I'm sure in his time, as we still see today, and really in regard to devotion to Mary in general, we see today how attacked and really how misunderstood is devotion to Our Lady. Now, I'm no theologian and I'm not a priest, so of course there is far better sources than myself for these types of things, but what I will say as a Catholic who has been blessed to be a child of Our Blessed Mother, I will say it's sad to see how disregarded Our Lady is by so many, when, as we read today and last week, she is really so necessary. I think some of the biggest mistakes that too often occur when non-Catholics inquire about devotion to Mary is either taking something out of context, or, kind of similar to that, not hearing or listening to the explanation given from the proper source. Note how I say proper source. I'll come back to that in a moment. But yes, Protestants hear us say, Mary is necessary for our salvation, 
and they immediately sound the alarms and don't listen any further. Now, some listen, of course, and earnestly try to understand, and as we know, we need grace to recognize the truth, so in some cases there could be a lack of cooperation with grace, but in other cases, even when some Catholics hear that statement, or ones similar to it, they can be confused at first. That's why taking something like that out of context is dangerous. We need the proper understanding of these things, and of course, with emphasis I say, we also need faith. Similar problems occur when reading Holy Scripture. One could pull a single Bible verse and leave it to their own understanding to determine its meaning, or take something literal when it wasn't supposed to be, or vice versa. Either way, we need a guide, and we need those proper sources like I mentioned before. Of course, we know that the proper source is the Holy Catholic Church. She it is who has the sole authority to interpret sacred scripture. But, as we see, so many neglect the authority of the Church, and do things their own way, and well, we see the fruit of that. So many false religions, confusion, and deception in the world today. Tying this in with the topic of the necessity of Our Lady's intercession for our salvation, we need to read further into that and see what Holy Mother Church teaches and what the saints and popes say and how they explain such a powerful statement before one sounds those alarms and refuses to hear any further. Thankfully, we've had a great explanation from St. Alphonsus in the past couple of readings here on the show to help us better understand this topic and defend devotion to Our Lady. I think it's most important to remember when speaking on this topic that our Lord wills it this way. He chooses this to be the case, that, as St. Bernard says, God wills that all graces should be bestowed upon us through Mary. Hence, the necessity we have of Our Lady's intercession is willed by God. God does not have to will it this way, but He chooses to do so according to His infinite wisdom and goodness. A great example of our Lord willing to do something one way when he could have willed it otherwise had he chose to do so is in the case of his sufferings. We know our Lord could have simply willed our redemption. One single drop of his most precious blood could save us all, but he chose to suffer. He chose to suffer as much as he did throughout his passion for us for a greater purpose. And in regard to Our Lady, well, our Lord does not need her, but he chooses to have her cooperate in our salvation by what she did for us on earth her prayers, sacrifices, sufferings, and what she does for us now in heaven by her prayers and intercession. Now, I've already feel like I've gone on too long about the, I'll say, heavier side of this topic, when again it's explained much better in the previous readings and other sources approved by Holy Mother Church. One thing I think is good to mention is, if anyone has questions about one of the truths of our faith, or needs a better explanation on something like this, don't hesitate to ask a priest. They'll be happy to guide you, but the important thing is not to let doubt fester inside you and let the devil, who is the author of confusion, sow confusion in your head. Certainly avoid seeking guidance in wrong places, but rather seek the proper counsel from a trusted source, like one of our true priests, and they'll help you to understand the mind of Holy Mother Church, which is guided by the Holy Ghost, who is the God of light and the author of all good. Okay, well this intro is going on pretty long, but if I could conclude with a more simple conclusion to take from these past couple of readings is this makes me think even more about God's goodness, and as I've spoken of before on the show, the wonderful gift that Our Lady is. Remember everything we've read in the previous chapters here on the show. Our Lady is the Mother of Mercy, not of Justice. And it's to this Mother of Mercy, this Mother so loving and compassionate, who is so ready to help us persevere, fight temptations, abandon sin, lead a holy life, love God and make it to heaven, she it is who God has given to us to be our mediatress of salvation, the dispenser of his graces, the co-redemptrix, the mother of our salvation, our guide in this valley of tears, our spiritual mother. What a gift. What a testament of God's goodness. What a consolation Mary is. So don't let the devil make us afraid to love her as if she were a hindrance to our love of God. No, the exact opposite. She is a sure way to our Lord. And with the help of her intercession, we can love God more perfectly and serve him more faithfully than we would on our own and with our own efforts. And with her help obtaining for us the grace we need, we can lead a holy life, save our souls, and make it to heaven. Why should we be afraid of that? Of course we shouldn't be. It is the devil who is afraid of that. He knows what Our Lady does for us. So that's why, like we've talked about before on the show, that's why by any means he has, he tries to keep us away from devotion to Mary, or weaken it in us or inspire us with a false devotion to her. So we should pray to the Holy Ghost to inspire us with a true devotion to our Blessed Mother, and pray with true confidence in her intercession to obtain for us all the graces we need for our salvation, and never forget how much our Lord and Our Lady love us. 
And I thought for the quote today, it would be nice to use Our Lady's own words from sacred scripture. Obviously, we know the prayer which Our Lady herself gave us, the Magnificat. And I just think in reflecting upon all these wonderful gifts given to Our Lady, to have been favored so highly by God in so many different ways, I just think it would be nice to hear her own words when she was given her praises from St. Elizabeth, kind of just showing us that wonderful humility of our Blessed Mother, who never keeps anything for herself, but always gives all glory to God. So today's quote comes from the Gospel of St. Luke. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation unto generations to them that fear him. He hath shewed might in his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath received Israel his servant, being mindful of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed for ever. So wonderful to hear the words of Our Lady reverting all the praises that she was receiving back to God, teaching us a wonderful lesson in humility that all the good that we possess, all the good that we're able to do, all the good we've been able to accomplish, it comes from God. Well, I think this is a good place to conclude this episode with our own prayer to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady's Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I thank you all for listening to today's episode. This is the Children of Our Lady podcast, brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. God bless you all, and Mary keep you.